Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Edge Hill University um, and the Faculty of Health and Social Care and to the Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practices Anniversary Lecture, lecture um, which tonight will be um, <coughs> delivered by Professor Peter Beresford on my left, and I'll introduce Peter in a moment. My name's Steve Hollisall. I'm the head of social work here, um, and I'm the boring bit of tonight, but hey-ho. Just to welcome you all here um, and to, I suppose, emphasise the fact that this is quite a significant event for all sorts of reasons, <clears throat> not the least of which is it marks a year, or just more than a year, since the I4P was developed with its aim of providing a, a collaborative platform for kind of multifaceted research and exploration of issues around public policy. Uh, and the theme for the lecture this year um, the first year, um, is how public participation and involvement in the policy domain um, is probably more important today than it's ever been. Um, and Peter's going to talk to us about that and give us his views, um, <coughs> you know, and rich and varied as they are. Peter is from, oh, I'll have to get this right, he's changed the name, I think, is that right, recently? He's Professor of Social Policy at Brunel University in London, visiting professor here and is chair and represents uh, various groupings on a number of national and international forums around public patient service user and carer participation involvement in all sorts of areas around policy. So what Peter's got to say I think will be quite insightful and will hopefully give us food for thought. Um, Peter's not going to talk for too long, um, he tells us, so I'm not going to talk for any longer, and I'll introduce you to Professor Peter Beresford. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. I hope, can people at the back here all right? Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, it's, it's terrific to be here. Thank you all for coming uh, uh, on a February night. I hope this can be a helpful opportunity for discussion. Um, I need to use notes. I'm not using PowerPoint. I'm not too brilliant on PowerPoint. Uh, but I do need notes and I want to get what I want to say properly done. And I should start by saying that this is a, a session, a lecture, uh, that's what it's been called, a lecture about knowledge, about knowing and knowers. It's also a lecture, as Steve has said, about involvement, participation and democracy. But most of all, I hope it's a lecture about rebuilding the relationship between our lives, our experiences, what people call experiential knowledge, policy, politics, and democracy. Now, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm going to try and explain as I go along what I say and say that clearly. And before anyone gets worried that I'm going to set us off in complicated and incomprehensible directions, let me just say, um, as a word of, of, of good faith, that uh, when my mother was alive, she was a bright woman, but she left school when she was 14, and when she was alive and when I was younger, I always took it as the acid test of my work and my writing uh, that if I could explain something to her, if she could understand what she read, then it would be okay. After all, what use is finding out something, knowing something, if you can't share it equally with other people? So that's, that's the moral that I start with. And I want to start with two brief stories, which I hope will be helpful for people. And they relate to two women. The first of these is Mary O'Hara, who some of you may be familiar with. And she's an award-winning journalist who writes often for The Guardian on mental health issues. Last year, uh, 2014, she published a book focusing on public service cuts in the UK called Austerity Bites. Has anyone come across it? I really would recommend it. And it tells the story, this book, after a, a load of work that she did, of the effects of the cuts in public services and welfare benefits that have been made by this coalition government in the name of austerity. It reports the impact that these have had on people on the receiving end of them. And it does that not just by hearing what traditional social policy experts and academics have to say about all that, but by going out, which is what she did, to listen to what a wide range of people experiencing these policy changes have to say. And Mary reports on the vast rise in food poverty, the reality of benefit cuts, 
on the receiving end, their ceilings, the sanctions, the relation of the striver versus skyver narrative to other realities, the destabilization of employment in Britain, the effects on groups like disabled people, mental health service users, and people who are long-term sick, uh, and the risks and threats that have been imposed on, on some of the most disadvantaged people in society. As Mary says, the book tells the story of, of all too often voiceless, in her words, invisible people who've been the victims of one of the most radically regressive and destructive economic experiments the UK has ever seen. And to do this, it draws on interviews between 2012 and 13 with people at the sharp end, as she says, of this political and ideological initiative. So one of the things for me that's important about this book is not just that it tells us about rising problems of poverty and inequality, but it tells this story from the direct experience of people that it's actually impacting on. We are hearing the story from the horse's mouth. Now, I was lucky enough to be present at the launch of Mary O'Hara's book, and she told a story uh, at the launch of a taxi journey home that she'd just been making a couple of days before. Uh, she said that she'd had a long conversation uh, with the taxi driver. I think he'd asked her what she did, and she'd explained her work on this project. And he'd then talked to her during the journey about how the same kinds of problems were hitting him uh, and his family. Loss of jobs, insecurity, threat of poverty, health problems, associated difficulties. And then just as he got to her front door, he told her that that was why he was going to vote for UKIP at the next general election. Mary said that she's a, a strong woman. Mary said she got him to switch off his engine and then they talked about what he planned to do for about half an hour. And I think that tells us something about the political alienation of many more people who may currently feel disempowered and excluded in our society. And I think it reflects the broader picture we've been hearing about of the gains achieved by UKIP as a far-right party in many deprived and disadvantaged areas, north and south, among groups who feel ignored, devalued and marginalised. And I hope we can hold on to this issue, which I want to come back to later. But I want to say one more thing about Mary O'Hara's book. She explains in her introduction that when she went into deprived communities and talked to people who were struggling, she didn't, as she said, have to put herself in someone else's shoes because, as she said, those were my shoes. That was how she grew up in Northern Ireland. She says, I know the crippling shame of poverty and what it feels like to internalise the shame. So Mary O'Hara writes about her subject from direct experience. It's not incidental, I think, that she has this background. I think it helps us to understand why she wrote this book, why she thinks as she does, why she has sought out and valued people with first-hand experience to make sense of her subject, why she honestly talks about a government's scarring savagery. She clearly does not see her shared experience as a weakness, but rather as a strength, and I share her view. Perhaps so also did many of those people she spoke to, who I guess would sense her understanding and trust her to treat their views and experience with honesty and respect. And I certainly would share that view of her. And why wouldn't I, as an academic, but also someone who's been through the experience of using mental health services long term, and live for seven years, um, pr probably the biggest challenge in my life, uh, from state intervention on welfare benefits. And I feel that my direct experience is as important for my own work and my own understanding as is any of the academic or research ex expertise and experience I've been able to acquire. So I hope that's a clear account of Mary. Does that make sense to people? I want to turn now to the second woman I want to refer to, Lisa McKenzie, and I first found out about Lisa from a story she wrote in Society Guardian January last month. Did any of you see it? It was a story, a whole page story in Society about a book that she's just published. She carried out an eight-year ethnographical study called Getting By, telling the story of working class families in St Anne's, Nottingham, uh, an area that's long experienced uh, problems but which has been experiencing the full blast of neoliberal social policy from Mrs Thatcher onwards. And as she said, she sought to challenge the conventional stereotypes of council estates and the people who live on them, 
offering an alternative to uh, prevailing prurient poverty porn and uh, what she called middle-class do-gooder interpretations. Again, like Mary O'Hara, she was studying and writing from shared experience. She tells us that age 30, she enrolled on an access to social work course, then did a degree, a master's, and a PhD, and now this study, just published by Policy Press, like Mary's. And this is a book which emphasizes the importance of lived experience and is based on research challenging austerity by someone coming from that position and critiquing social policy from the viewpoint of valuing lived experience and offering ways forward uh, based on involvement. In an interview separate from the Guardian article that she had uh, with the launch of the book with the Nottingham Post, she said, like most working class women, I wanted to do something more worthwhile with my life. I thought I could do more than make tights. She wasn't putting other women down when she said that. She was speaking for her own aspirations. And getting by draws on both her experience of life in St Anne's and years of subsequent research, as I've mentioned, on the district and its people. And she sees herself as an activist as well as an academic. And the Nottingham Post journalist interviewing her noted that academic Liz McKenzie was part of the community she researched and asked, in his words, but doesn't that make it harder to be objective? And her response is one to pay serious attention to, I'd say, and is central to what I'm trying to talk about here now. She said that the study of a community from the inside is an important addition to research of estate life. And she says this, which I think we should try and hear very clearly. I think researchers should come under as much scrutiny as their research. Our own social position is crucial. I never saw it as a disadvantage to come from the community I was writing about. Now I just want to go back to the point raised by the interviewer, the view that if you are close to your subject of study, then it has the potential to undermine your capacity to understand, analyse and be helpful about it, which has in fact been an article of faith with traditional research, what's been called positivist research. And there's been an emphasis on being scientific, being objective in traditional social policy and social research too. And this positivist model highlights the need for and possibility of research, which as it says is neutral, unbiased and distanced from its subject. The unbiased value-free position of the researcher is seen as a central tenet of such research by claiming to eliminate the subjectivity of the researcher, the credibility of the research and its findings thereby would be maximised. Such research, the argument goes, is rigorous and reliable and can be replicated in similar circumstances, situations and always will offer uh, corresponding results. Research, it's said, which does not follow these rules and which is not based on the, this value set has long been seen uh, as inferior with less valid and reliable results. Now the point for me about this, the implicit but not made explicit point is of course that this really devalues first-hand or experiential knowledge. Yet we know that in ordinary life we place a particular value on such knowledge, thus the importance attached to first-hand and eyewitness accounts. User involvement in research and user controlled research of course themselves do place a value on such experiential knowledge and giving it value to the, in the process and findings of such research. That's one of their defining features. But traditional research, and these research values persist uh, in medical research and health research uh, within significant areas of the NHS, grant it less value, less credibility and less legitimacy. Often, as we've seen in social policy, it's been ignored or marginalised. Meanwhile, what's called the knowledge claims of researchers without such direct experience are seen to be stronger, untainted, objective, neutral, distant. What this means is that if an individual has direct lived experience of problems like disability or poverty, whatever, oppression, discrimination of cuts and austerity, when such research values are accepted, what they say, people with lived experience who know it firsthand, their accounts and narratives will, of course, be seen as having less legitimacy and less authority. And we can see how currently government and policymakers 
are determinedly ignoring and excluding such knowledge from their calculations because people experiencing the hardship that's happening now will be seen as too close to the problem. They cannot claim at all that they are neutral, objective or distant from it. So in addition to any discrimination, and we should really be so mindful of this, any discrimination and oppression they already may face, they are likely to be seen as less reliable and a less valid source of knowledge. By this logic, if someone has experience of discrimination and oppression, they can expect routinely to face further discrimination and be further marginalised by being seen as having less credibility and being much less of a reliable source of knowledge. So are these people uh, left out of the reckoning and, and what they know uh, to be counted as worthless? Which, of course, if we take that view, further invalidates people who are re already heavily disadvantaged. So such traditional conventional research can play a key part in the subordination and othering, making people seem like a different species of people. And that's, I think, sadly, a role historically played by much social policy research, where problems can only come to be seen as real when they are duly reported and recognised by researchers and other experts. Then it's their interpretations and versions of issues and phenomena which are accepted. This issue of marginalising the knowledge of different groups has begun to be talked about, and it's begun to be talked about uh, in terms of epistemic violence uh, or injustice, meaning attacking or marginalising, because that's what we mean by epistemology, well, that's a word I hope not to use today, what people know, and in this case what people know who experience abuse, discrimination and oppression. So it really is a matter of it ain't what you know, it's who knows it. And we've seen how powerful people have ignored and rejected the knowledge and whistleblowing of children and young people being sexually abused in institutional numbers in the past, which we're hearing about now, right through to those experiencing currently the cruelties and injustices of welfare reform. And I want to suggest that it's time we were brave, uh, and I want to argue that we try and rethink uh, conventional assumptions about credibility and legitimacy in research, and one assumption which I think may particularly need to be re-examined is that the greater the distance there is between direct experience and its interpretation, as by traditional researchers or policy makers, the more reliable it is. And I want to suggest instead that maybe it's time to explore the evidence and the theoretical framework for testing out whether instead the shorter the distance there is between direct experience and its analysis, its interpretation, as for example can be offered by user involvement in research and particularly user controlled research, then the less distorted, inaccurate and damaging resulting knowledge may be. So I'm making the case for including experiential knowledge, that which we can only know from living it, uh, centrally on unequal terms to other kinds of knowledge. I'm not suggesting we privilege it, I'm saying it should be treated with equality. And I know that the work of both Mary O'Hara uh, and Liz McKenzie, as well as many more, points us in this direction. We are beginning to see the real involvement of ordinary and disadvantaged people in research, not as its participants or subjects, but in its process, in undertaking it, in carrying it out, in initiating it. And there's also a growing body of and discussion about user-controlled research, where people who've traditionally been the objects of research are now carrying out their own research. But if we can feel this shift uh, in research and in our own sense of a right to be able to speak for ourselves, whoever we are, whatever our identity is, of the value and legitimacy of our own lived experience and our own knowledge, this certainly does not seem to be transferring, I would suggest, into the political process. Instead, indeed, the opposite that seems to be happening with governments that are more and more narrowly elite-based, massively increasingly divides in our society between rich and poor, less and less social mobility, lower levels of political participation, and the particular exclusion of some groups from the political process on the basis of gender, age, disability, class, culture, faith, sexuality, ethnicity, and that worsening, if anything. But there are, I think, lessons for how we might make inroads into this from what we've learned challenging the dominance 
of old elites and values in research and policy development. You remember Mary O'Hara's taxi driver, who experienced the bad effects of so-called austerity policy, but as a result was going to vote for a party that would push such neoliberal policy through even more arbitrarily and determinedly. Change will not come through telling him what to do, to do differently, or enlisting him crudely as a foot soldier in someone else's campaign or campaigns. It will only come, I would suggest, through an extension of the kind of involvement which we've begun to see over the last 20 or more years, which Mary O'Hara and Liz McKenzie have been part of and sought to support listening to people's voices, supporting them to develop, involving them in change. And a key, if often devalued and degraded concept in making this happen, which I think at its best um, is at the heart of such initiatives, is the idea of empowerment. Uh, and I, I see empowerment used as something that you can get from using certain cosmetics, etc., etc. We'll put that, we'll put that to the side. But it's an idea, truly, empowerment, which grew out of the American Black civil rights struggle of the last century. And I believe it's been at the heart of all the new social movements that have achieved so much since. It's a wonderful idea, in my view, because it seeks to reunite us with politics and ideology, rather than perpetuate the massive gap that's continued to build up and use us just to serve other people's political and ideological purposes, which so often even oppositional policies have been reduced to. So it begins, this idea of empowerment, by drawing a distinction between personal and political empowerment. And personal empowerment means gaining a better understanding of ourself, ourselves, who we are, what's happening to us, how we may be being oppressed, how we are encouraged to internalise that oppression, and how we are set on the road to be turkeys who vote for Christmas. We have a chance to explore with such an idea our own feelings and experience, to rethink these with others who share similar experiences, to value the resulting accumulation of experiential, collective experiential knowledge, to gain confidence, skills and assertiveness based on what we've been through and achieved in the face of the difficulties we've lived with. And over and over again, we read that the way to achieve such personal empowerment is through linking up with others with similar experience who've undergone the same kinds of hardship and oppression and doing things together with them collectively. That's been a cornerstone, I have to say, of my own experience. My involvement in the survivors and disabled people's movement has been a, a, a liberatory uh, element in my life. And then this, of course, this notion of personal empowerment allows us to move on to a second step, to engage with others with shared understanding and experience, with that confidence and knowledge we've accrued, to work together for the change, the broader change that we want, in line with our analysis, our research, our shared experience, our self-determined aims and goals. We're in a position together now to take collective action to make a difference, to change. So empowerment, empowerment for me highlights the need for two kinds of change and their interrelation. Change within us to equip us to work for broader social change. And that way we are no one's stage army, we are struggling for ourselves. Whatever the level, whatever the level. And what's so wonderful I think about this approach, and I've seen it over the years in, in the Service User Disabled People's Organisation I'm part of, Shaping Our Lives, uh, please do Google us, Shaping Our Lives, loads of helpful resources I hope to be downloaded free, is that, that while there may be limits, of course, always, especially in difficult times like the present, uh, maybe limits to what we can achieve politically in the structures that we live under or with. Although there will be some chance for change, I think I never give up on the fact that we can make some change, but the changes that we can make within ourselves, with each other, are fundamental and life-enhancing and changing. And they can never be taken away from us. How we can rethink who we are, what's been done to us. It's been the story of all the movements in the latter part of the last century and those that continue. We will none of us be so easily suborned by the PR and dishonesty and self-interest of modern institutionalised politics and politicians. Instead, I think we will begin to have a chance of engaging with and challenging them on more equal terms and undermining them as we grow in numbers and in political understanding. 
This, for me, is the mighty oak that can grow from the little acorn of our unique lived experience. Conventional politics, the media, fundamentally seek to alienate us from our own experience. We know that's true. The kinds of campaigns highlighted by Lisa McKenzie and Mary O'Hara, I think, seek to reunite us with it. Thus we can, as they say, work for the transformation of public policy through the inclusion of people's lived experience and the collective action that can follow from that. And that, for me, is the route to a different kind of politics, which can be taken forward where we do have the detail. At a time when representative democracy in nations like the UK is under greater threat than ever, I think it offers the chance of pulling down the barriers facing real, humane democracy, signposts us how these may be overcome. That's why, in my, in my view, building such involvement, based on what may seem to be this small thing, each of us's own experiential knowledge, offers us perhaps maybe the only route out of the present ideological impasse, bit by bit, from the bottom up. Thank you. Sorry about the Southwoods. I, I have to tell you, <laughs> every time I leave London and come north, come to Scotland, go to Wales, whatever, it feels better. I cannot tell you how utterly, uh, utterly extreme the consequences of the policies that we are undergoing as a nation feel when you're in London. And whenever I read, as I constantly read in the press, uh, the controlled press, about we, we are all in it together and we must be austere, and I go down the road and I look at the cars that come to the private school or I make the bus trip to Harrods and I see the multitude of extremely expensive cars that surround it, I think to myself, no. Any questions? Um, Peter, thank you very much for a very inspirational talk. Um, I just wondered if um, I might ask you to perhaps explore um, some of the power relationships within groups. So um, you're talking about empowering um, a, a community, but within that community there are different layers. So I'm, I'm thinking about the power relations between men and women, between um, minority ethnic and ma ma minority, um, majority ethnic. Um, could you just explore those, because within those strata are also tensions as well? Of course there are, and the fact that you asked the question, and the fact that that question is one that's concerned many people in those different experiences for what's quite a long time now, highlights the fact we can't just gloss over those differences and divisions, and I, I'm not suggesting we do. But I do think they are complex, and I say that speaking as a... a if I'm th I mean, we all have complex identities, and... I see mine as quite complex, of course, like we all do. Um, but for a long time, the identity I couldn't escape from was being a mental health service user because it so impacted on what I couldn't, couldn't do and what happened to me. And uh, that, that, that actually helped me to get a grip, before it was called that, on issues of intersectionality and the complexity of them. The fact that we are different and we are the same and that when we're, in a, we're part of a different group, some of the same oppressions may continue to exist. Uh, and, and I have to say that I don't think you can handle those oppressions without confronting them. And I, I can remember from, from a long time ago when I was early on in the survivor movement, talking to women survivors who themselves would raise the point, um, which I didn't have an answer to, but they had answers to, about who they felt more comfortable with. Um, other women, other survivors who might be men or women. And it was an open question. And I, and I know that in, in the, the organisation which I've referred to, Shaping Our Lives, where we have sought always, uh, over our 15 or more years' existence now, right from our early days, to address all the realms of difference and division, not just issues of being a service user or not, but around sexuality, age, disability, gender, se and so sexuality, etc., that it isn't something that comes naturally to any of us. And... Uh, 
there are many divisions and the only way you deal with those divisions is being open about them and seeking actively to deal with them. The, on the only difference there is nowadays when we talk about a community, I think, is that when we talked about community 30 years ago, we were using a word that was cosy, but actually meant something that keeps loads of people out. Uh, when we talk about community now, we have to be more respectful of the fact that there are many communities in a community. I'm not saying that means they are addressed, but I think we, if we are seeking to struggle uh, uh, against dominant politics and ideology, uh, I think it's necessary for all of us to struggle as best we can and get as much support and be supportive of picking up on the issue you've just raised. mental health issues so you're talking about people who are excluded from gaining knowledge but also influencing it what advice would you give to prevent tokenism really in research because I've seen lots of things where we've got the token person with a learning difficulty we've got a token person with all you know autism and schizophrenia and you just know that their actual experiences because of communication needs and one thing and another how would you, what advice would you give in, in helping that research to actually reflect what that person has to offer in terms of... Well, I'll, I'll try and share with you things I've learned. Um, and I think I learned the most about the particular issue I think you're raising from a man called Vic Forrest, who I first got to know because I was supervising a PhD he was doing. And the PhD he was doing uh, came from a, a long experience that Vic had of seeking to be a supporter uh, with people with learning difficulties. A supporter in the sense, and he's, he's a kind of a model of truthfulness in this, a supporter, and I've seen, uh, you know, I've worked with him very often since, and with people that he's known, that I've got to know, as people with learning difficulties. A supporter enabling them to, uh, to play an equal role in things. Well, of course, to play an equal role in anything as a person with learning difficulties it means the anything has to change. But you also need your own support. And one of the things that what Vic was doing was he wanted to see uh, what the role of a supporter would be if a group of people with learning difficulties were carrying out their own research. <laughs> By the time we finished his PhD, which I'm proud to say he got, and we had celebrations with the people who'd been involved, and they produced their research, and if you want to see their research, then it's called We're Not Stupid, and it's on the Shaping Our Lives website. Um, but what he came to talk about was that you would... And I've been to presentations like this. What you said really rings bells. You would, you would read reports supposedly written by people with learning difficulties that any average member of the population would have felt impressed if they could understand it or write it. So you just knew that this was, this was some kind of complex tokenism. And what I learnt from Vic was you have to be absolutely explicit in how this was done. And you have to realise that support is a very complex and skilled role. Uh, and, and, it, and it's about you not doing the talking and you not doing the influencing, but enabling people to, to, to do it themselves. And when you read We're Not Stupid, you, it's, it's like hearing some of the people, I don't know all the people who were involved in it, but you can see that it's what they said. Because, and they've, th we've just done a chapter for a book on social work research. And the lion's share of the chapter was about impact. That was what they asked us to write about. So the lion's share of that chapter was done by two women with learning difficulties, uh, Gina and Jennifer, with the support of Vic, having conversations, putting them together, and then topped and tailed. And we've just sent that off to the editors. And I, obviously I've read it, and you can see that it's a truth. It's what they have to say. But that's the other thing which fortunately is beginning to happen in research. Um, people will express themselves in different kinds of ways, often, of course, not in words, written words at all. But I, I would say, if you're suspicious, be suspicious. And if this does not sound real, it won't be. And, and it's such a disempowering act. And I've, I've been to presentations where I've seen people ruthlessly tokenised, and it's cruel and inappropriate. And the opposite's empowering and liberatory. I hope that gets to grips a bit. And um, please do feedback. Um, it would be nice to hear what you say. What was your name again? Thank you. I think what you said, I mean, so many of the people haven't got a voice, but they've got so much teaching. And we could do so much better if we could just find that way. 
I have found it really depressing, I have to be honest with you, that uh, if I look back over four years of this government, not saying the last one didn't have massive problems and failings, but we can take this as a watershed. And I look at what was coming from people as mental health service users, people with, with uh, conditions that went up and down, what they were saying from a very early stage about what was really going on about benefits, and the way that, that the traditional supporters, the big volorgs, the big charities, the Labour Party, were being very careful what they said. And it, then, you, you know, they, people kept that steam up, and then bit by bit, later on, some researchers, some policymakers do echo what those people said, but it's four years down the line, and people have died, and people are undergoing the most terrible suffering. And, the, you know, we don't have to talk about Rotherham and the sexual abuse that's been highlighted there. This is a, a universal, the disrespect for unpowerful voices. It's a form of power that's not talked about enough, is it? The power to be able to be heard. Estate, housing, housing Association estate and seen how disabled people live or the vulnerable live? Or have you just looked at it from the outside? Well, I'm, I'm both lucky and unlucky. Um, I live in London, I come from where I live and uh, in the 1970s I managed to find, which you certainly wouldn't do now, uh, a flat, an unfurnished flat, privately rented, which is where we have lived all our lives bringing up our children. It's a privately rented flat, it's a semi-basement, uh, we still rent it, it is damp all over, um, the, the plaster is being held up still by the wallpaper. May I just, l let me just finish. Um, we had the environmental health people come, who served a notice on the landlord, uh, because no work was ever done, and it was so damp, and what happened then, and we were told by the local community development workers after they'd encouraged us all locally to get involved, uh, this is what landlords always do. Uh, they did some work required by the um, Environmental Health Department. Then they abandoned the work halfway through. The work was never f finished properly. And now we have, for the last few years, made a decision never to try and get the work done. We hope to leave um, because it would create a whole set of other problems for us of how they would put the rents up. So I have not lived on a council estate. I've lived in private rented accommodation uh, for all my kind of like family life. And it's been dreadful. Uh, and I have a good understanding from other people who live on council estates, what it's like and it's, it's kind of complexity. Can I ask why you asked? I just find that sometimes people from a council estate are stigmatized. If you're from a council estate, you're no good. Um, and I know you went to them about disabled people, they get help that perhaps people that are non-disabled don't get, but generally, you live on a council estate, you're never going to work. I think that's the, you see, I think that's the point. And that, it's a stigma. That, I think I, that's I the point that. That, that, that Lisa is making. Um, obviously not everybody on, in the St Anne's estate will have a label attached to them, but people are written routinely off, and there is a stereotype about council estates which percolates through to loads of public places, how people are seen. The irony is, if I could just say, that where I live in North Battersea, which was once called an inner city area of deprivation, very high ranking, is now a place where if you did live in a high-rise flat, you'd probably be paying half a million pounds for it. And, it, and it, the, the degree of social engineering that's taken place in North Battersea is frightening. And there is now a polarised community where we live. There is the school that our youngest daughter last went to as a primary school, where most of the children, it was a school that uh, was struggling, where most of the children came from black and minority ethnic communities, most were on free meals. And then round the corner, uh, the, most recently the efforts are to make it into an academy, and round the corner is the private school that is 21,000 a year for children to go to, where almost all the children are white, and the parents come in their Chelsea tractors. Uh, this is a place totally divided. And when we had our, when we had our riots uh, two or three years ago at Clapham Junction, uh, which were very complex, um, the people who were involved in the rioting quotes, and it was complex, I don't want to do, do it an injustice, 
were both black and white people, though the aim was to present it as a, in racialized terms. But the next day, in a number of papers, there was a double page spread of people clearing up in Wandsworth. And a company had obviously organized an effort, and people had all been equipped with um, brushes to sweep up the streets. There was a massive photograph of all these people with brushes. And I looked very carefully in the photographs, and everyone was white. And uh, this is a, it's a very strange place to live, North Battersea now, where there are regular murders from people who have little opportunity, and there is an unbelievable level of wealth. I'd just like to open up that I am from Rotherham, which you mentioned earlier. I am a minority, and I went through the minor strikes and all this, and there was no education for people from a council estate. Does it necessarily mean that we have to be written off? You know, in a way, people are writing off Rotherham because of the problems that are there now. Well, I don't, don't want to hog the mic, the two of us, because this is an open conversation, but I think I need to do you justice. And I want to say the one lesson that comes to me of Rotherham, uh, which I, is always only in the small print in certain, in certain forms of media, which is that all the time that the things were happening which are now coming to light, there were quite clearly some people as both ordinary practicing social workers and youth workers who were going on and on about what was happening. That's a picture I've picked up from the media. The picture we've profoundly had from the media has been of social services and other state services that were part of this corruption. The picture I've tried to pull together myself as best I can from inadequate evidence, we don't get good reporting, I don't think, of these things, has been of systems and leaders, political uh, and bureaucratic, who have been quite happy for the ongoing oppression of children and young people to, to be a, you know, left for years and years and years. And do I feel that it should be as you say? Why would I be citing Lisa and Mary if I didn't take the same view as you? And that's what's beautiful about the two pieces of work. Uh, one, that these are people that have their own understandings and experience themselves. As Mary said, she grew up on a council estate in Northern Ireland, uh, as, did, as did Lisa have experience. And two, I think they, they engender the trust and understanding and support and equality that could come from people that they talk with. Hello, Peter. Um, I just a query about the relationship between experiential knowledge and so-called academic knowledge, because some people would think, wouldn't they, that their experiential knowledge is forcing them or encouraging them to vote for what we might call far-right parties like UKIP, because they feel their experiences yeah. of living in this country is doing it. So I would suggest, really, that experiential knowledge isn't enough that there's a relationship between experiential and academic knowledge, and without that, both of them are useless. I don't know what you think. Well, I, I hope you did pick up on me saying that I was aiming for an equality and inclusion, not for a, a ranking and a hierarchy. The trouble is we do have a ranking and a hierarchy. Uh, academic knowledge, so-called expert knowledge, is given credibility where experiential knowledge isn't. And uh, a, a friend of mine, who is a, a, a survivor too, She's doing a dissertation, a PhD at the moment, on mental health service users' own models of madness. And she has made the decision in what she's focusing on that she's interested in, in those models and those discussions, those narratives, where people have had the chance not just to invest in the dominant narratives, the medical narrative, but alternatives. So I don't think individualised... Um, uh, experiential knowledge without support and that support can be of all kinds uh, it, it can be from within with help from someone we trust it can be f and so helpfully from other people with shared understanding uh, I think when we have the chance to subject our experience to other critiques than the ones that ordinarily come our way then we have a chance for an experiential knowledge that's a challenge what I, what I find interesting and fascinating, and I fear we're, we may be needing to know more about this now, is if you go back to those imposed ideologies of the 20th century, particularly the first half, fascism and communism, uh, both of them enlisting vast tr tracts of the population in their support uh, to kill each other, what they said they were aiming to do was very similar. 
uh, and we were enlisted to die at their behest. Um, and it's about escaping from a notion of narrative and experience that others interpret to be able to have the chance, that's why I put personal empowerment into the uh, equation, to have the chance to be able to think it through. And some of us can do that very easily. We have loads of chances and experience to do it. It's not very easy for many. You, we've just done another project talking to people who are very unhappy about medicalised understandings of mental illness as mental health service users. But of course, most of us, and I can see it still in me, that's the only model we know. So we've got to find a way out of that, uh, which I think gives point to what you've asked. Um, yeah, thanks very much for this very spirited argument for social change, which I completely agree with. Um, I wonder, however, if I can pick you up on the link between empowerment and social change, and I'm not sure um, that the link between the two is as strong as you m seem to suggest. Uh, the, f the curious thing about empowerment is that once people, some people are empowered, they very often join the ranks of those that you might think are not actually the ones who advocate for change, social change. Yeah. So I wonder what your thoughts are on this, on this link and how strong that link is. Yeah, these are the kind of issues that I sit there grappling late at night with because they're all true and uh, that's right. So if, 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 if we seek theoretically that there should be the empowerment of women, we arrive at a prime minister like Mrs Thatcher but we won't forever uh, be having prime ministers who are women like Mrs. Thatcher. And this is not an easy or a 100% or a, a connection. But I think the only way that we can have a meaningful hand in politics and not be someone's stage army uh, is through the process of empowerment. And I do think that mostly what it is for people, it is, um, it is the, the opportunity for internal change. And the opportunity for external change especially at a time when, which is so regressive, where the tide is in the opposite direction, can be seen as limited. But for me, a very important example, and I know this is not about global politics, uh, is, is of people as parents giving birth to children who are in one way or another disabled, have some kind of impairment. And I, I've spoken to lots of people um, who are in middle age or older, whose parents seeking desperately to do the right thing as they were instructed, gave their children up to be institutionalised. And I've known the children who had to experience, in one case, a, a good friend of mine from the age of three, an institutionalisation of his life, uh, which I think it would be very difficult ever to escape from. And I'm not saying things are absolutely chickadee-boo now, but I think parents now who may have a child uh, with, with a learning difficulty or an impairment will be much more determined to fight for the equal rights and inclusion of that child than could have ever been known was possible by their parents or grandparents. And I put that down very simply, I have to say, to the efforts of the Disabled People's Movement. When I go on holiday, as I do every year, to Norfolk and go on the broads in a boat, the fact that when you go on the boat they've got proper equipment to mean that wheelchair users can get on the pleasure boat is for me a direct consequence of the work of people like Vic Finkelstein, Mike Oliver, Jenny Morris, etc., etc. Things are different, it's slow, but that's the irony of our age, that in some ways we can see how we're going back to Victorian Britain, and in other ways we can see how we're escaping it. I think it was interesting what my partner said to me this morning when we were talking about Mrs Thatcher and the latest revelation of a woman who was a, a, an extreme homophobe uh, and m supporter of family and family values, the enormous effort she made to safe, save and safeguard a paedophile. Uh, and as my partner said, truly she was an upkeeper of Victorian values, because that's how it was then. But it's not all that direction now, and it's, it's, these are very complex times. Just a question in terms of uh, influencing. Um, I totally concur with this idea of 
you know, of actually giving equality to uh, experiential research. And uh, I've been involved, for example, in workshops around autoethnography, capturing experiences in a different way, but also in the form of a credible research. And there's been some success around publishing books in spite of the, the ref exercises that we have in the UK around measuring yeah. um, um, outcome, you know, outputs of research. Um, do you have any more um, sort of, I suppose, experiences or advice to share around how um, research can actually get out there in the UK in a way that actually achieves that equality uh, so that we can actually n flip the narrative um, for those who wish to c engage in experiential research and actually get the message out there that actually there's a different tale to tell that's not always just happening in some forms of research that's given credibility currently? Well, uh, that, that's a profound question, and, and uh, it, it, it is one of the questions at the heart of, of the matter. For me, I, what reassures me, what keeps me going, is the sense that we would not be having this conversation 20 or 30 years ago, that this is, for all the terrible things that are happening globally, uh, the, 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 the effects of um, disempowerment for so many people globally, the damage being done to our world um, and its environment, this is a time of change. Uh, and times of change are very difficult. And times of change can feel like uh, one step forward and two steps back. The, the fact that the, this ref, and it won't be the same for the next one, this ref did go on about impact. And some people and some panels did interpret that to mean making, making a case for the kind of research that you've been talking about or I've been talking about. And of course, there's, there's, there's many expressions of the kind of participatory research, and I think they are on the ascendancy. There are counterforces, um, but I would go back to models of change, because I'm not saying we shouldn't, I try and do it myself. We should be trying to influence the policy makers uh, and the political process with what we find out. Uh, that's a, a hard and difficult and distant job, and how you would show a connection, I've no idea, uh, but you try. And sometimes you can make a little bit of progress, perhaps. But where I think you can make progress with the kinds of stuff you're talking about is within people's inner selves. And as we change within ourselves, we will not be the same outside. I mean, I don't know if other people will disagree with me, but whenever I go to Scotland and I talk to people in Scotland, and it's even expressing itself in political terms about welfare reform, there are not the same conversations about welfare claimants in Scotland, <coughs> by and large, that I hear in London, that I hear in London. You hear people trotting out what the politicians are saying, people who themselves will be seen as the same rubbish by those politicians. That's one of the divisive horrors of our present politics. But I, I do think, you know, if we are trying to increase those relationships and conversations with each other, I mean, for me, the, a, a great thing that we should be doing, which has more and more begun to happen, is that we as service users are talking more to people who identify as carers, that we as mental health service users are talking more to people who identify as living with HIV AIDS, uh, that we as practitioners are supporting and having those same conversations and alliances. So we've got to build on ourselves, that's what I think. We've got to, to try and make change whether we have a chance of making some change more than we have in other directions without giving up the other directions. And that's not a council of, uh, this is how you do it, folks, and there's the tool book coming, but I think that that is how it works for people. The challenge is, though, isn't it, surely, that p people who experience discrimination, oppression, whatever, understand it perfectly. It's how we sort of get other people to ac you know, acknowledge that you know, this is happening to people. You know, and we need to, you know, change things. And, you know, it is a political thing. It is about, you know, policy and, and, and that. But it's, it's a bit like the taxi driver you, you mentioned. He's going to vote UKIP. Well, the, 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 we the, the, we, we've never been, uh, in my lifetime, we've never been in a time where the media has been so narrowly, the print media has been so narrowly controlled. You know, the best that we've got, apart from the Morning Star, which is not actually available that much everywhere, the best that we've got is The Guardian. Uh, and The Guardian is an ambiguous and complex voice. But that's the best we've got. And the rest we've got is owned by a very narrow range of, of independent, incredibly powerful and irresponsible proprietors and companies. And if we, if we try and go the same way that they can go, 
well, you know, we will always lose. Uh, we haven't got their power. That's why we have to do things in much more intimate, face-to-face, uh, -face, personal ways. I know people may laugh at me, but I was thinking the other day, and I know that Miliband kind of said something a bit like that, but um, if I really wanted to make change, for example, with that taxi driver, apart from what Mary did, which was, I think, the right thing, then I would do the same as Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I would pal up with somebody, because it's a bit hard doing it on your own, and go around and have the courage to keep knocking on the door. Uh, that's what you need to do. You need to talk to people. Uh, we need to make relationships. It has to be that way. Any other way, there are mediators, and the mediators aren't going to do what you're hoping that they will do. It has been very, very brief. It will be. Thank you. Peter, I'm fascinated, particularly on this view on empowerment. It challenged me. Paolo Freire's work, I, I, I just wanted to know your view in particular on his thoughts on freedom and how the powerless often, he admits, are frightened of freedom and yet he, he argues that freedom is what we ought to, it's not outside us, it's within us and it's what we should fight for. It's indispensable as part of our human existence to be free. Well, I, I, always, I have to be honest with you, I, I value the idea of his idea of conscientialization, which I think is around empowerment. I do find in translation his stuff very difficult to understand, so I'm not an authority on freedom, which I haven't, to be truthful, read. Uh, freedom is such a big and ambiguous concept, we know what it can mean, freedom to or freedom from. So I don't know that if I was knocking on the door as a Jehovah's Witness on this issue, I'd be starting with freedom. I'd be starting with things a bit nearer to home. I think the, 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 the thing that is the truth is that it, it is this brilliance, like someone I know says, you pick up the Evening Standard, which is a free newspaper run by a Russian emigre and multi, well, billionaire. So it's really close to where we are today. Um, and it will tell you about the properties that you can buy very close to where I live on Battersea Power Station site. Uh, where originally it was going to be, what was it, £600,000 for a studio flat. They are already being resold before it's even built for £800,000. Um, and it's this notion that we can see ourselves as the people we aren't. We are not going to be buying those homes. We are not, can I tell most readers of Evening Standards, going to be threatened by mansion tax. Let's get real. Uh, we will not be building a, a cellars under our house which take up several other areas of, of, of uh, the underground so that they are, our rich neighbours are complaining. We will be living in Shitsville as ordinary people in London. And I mean that seriously. The divide is terrifying. But it's presented to us in an aspirational way as though this is us. And we must hate these claimants. We must hate these mental health service users who are scroungers. Blah, blah. And it's, a, it's what Goebbels said. Make it a simple message and repeat it over and over again. And uh, he was no fool, and they're not fools either. And we have to do things in different ways. And we have to do things more and more ourselves in the intimacies and routines of our daily life. That's what I think is, is good about the true revolutionaries, that the people living their life as if someone, who said it? Living your life as if the revolution had already taken place. It's a lovely quotation. Uh, and in fact, it's quite difficult to do, um, but it's what we can aspire to. Uh, and, and that, that, but I, I do feel we're, we're in a time of hope. Uh, you know. Even however bad things are. I, I, I listened to my partner who is so excited that so far all the appeals she's done for ESA, PIP and the rest, she hasn't lost one of them with a the person that she's supporting. And who tells me what it's like to go into those appeals, which by some happy accident, which this government yet hasn't been able to change, are still situations where the people who sit on those appeals treat service users who are absolutely hammered by the benefits system as if, going back to, I can't remember where you were, the point about the council estates, as if they were full, decent human beings. Treat them with respect. Um, and that's being broken down, but there are still bits of it, and we can be rebuilding more. On that note... <laughs> Just, just very quickly, my name's John Diamond, I'm based in I4P, I'm
currently working in the Faculty of Education, so it's a genuinely collaborative event this evening. Um, I'm going to take away lots, and one of the things I'm going to take away is that business about how you work on thinking about yourself, and it connects with the first question you were asked about power relations and what it is, in my case, as an academic, as a professional, as a, as a white middle-class professor, what it is I give up in order that some of those transformational relationships you were talking about can take place. Peter has a few minutes over coffee. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.